Okay, so we are going to continue with example 13 in your notes. You have looked at how to relate the rate equation to the mechanisms. And then you have also looked at what we call the rate determining step. It is the slow step. It's quite self-explanatory, this rate determining step. This step is the one that affects or determine the rate of your overall equation. So it is only this step that matters. And because it determines the rate of your equation, this step is also the ones that contain the species or the reactants that appear in your rate equation. And then we also looked at the concept of intermediate. An intermediate is a species that is not in the overall balance equation. However, it is present in your mechanisms. It is produced and later on it is being consumed. Okay, so that's why you don't see it in your overall rate equation. That's why we call it uh, an intermediate. It's like a species that only exists for a short time. Okay, and later on, uh, I will teach you about catalysts. Okay, so what's the difference between an intermediate and a catalyst? Catalyst also doesn't appear in your overall balance equation. However, it appears in the mechanism. Okay, so the rate determining step can be identified from a rate equation given that the mechanism is known. For example, here we have a propane undergoing bromination under alkaline solution. The overall reaction is given. So you can see that your reactants is your propane, bromine, and hydroxide ions to form a bromopropane, water, and bromide ion. The rate equation is given as rate equals to K times the concentration of the propane and the concentration of the hydroxide. Okay, so this uh, rate equation can actually tell you uh, which one is the slow step or the rate determining step. Actually, what is the question? Uh, okay, the question is, it gives you the answer already, but I'll just explain to you how we know that step one is the rate determining step. When we write the balance equation, everything is shown to us as from reactants to the products, okay? But the mechanism is a two-step mechanism. Step one is where the hydroxide ions attacks the propane. And then step two, okay? So in step one, you form an intermediate. How do I know this is intermediate? Because it doesn't appear in your chemical equation, full chemical equation. And also later on, it is being used up or it is being consumed, okay? Second step, intermediate reacts with bromine to form your bro um, products, okay? Right, this one you're already given the answer, but if you didn't know the answer, you look at the species that appears on your rate equation. So this species also appears in the slow rate determining step. So you compare your step one, you've got propane and hydroxide. So you've got propane, you've got hydroxide. So this confirms that step one is the slow rate determining step, okay? And step two contains an intermediate and bromine. And this um, rate equation does not show any intermediate. Of course, intermediate will not show. Um, and the most obvious is the bromine is not in the rate equation, okay? So how do we uh, explain this? So we say, if you come across this kind of question, we say from the rate equation, it can be deduced that
only propane and hydroxide ions are involved <clears throat> in the rate determining step. Okay, and most importantly, not or excluding bromine. Okay, since so step one of the mechanism. The mechanism, oops, cannot spell, involves CH3C2, um, son of the formula, CH3, CH2, CH3, and hydroxide ion. This step is the slow rate determining step. Okay, simple. It's simple, but sometimes um, students don't know how to explain or what the um, question is asking for when it says explain. Okay, because maybe to you, well, it's obvious, but then when the question wants you to explain, you have to relate the rate equation, and also the species in the mechanism. And how do you go from the mechanisms to your overall equation? You just add up step one and step two. Basically, you add all your reactants together and then all your products together, okay? I don't know if you can see this, but when I add everything all the reactants together and the products together, you can see that I can cancel out the intermediate. Okay, so just label this as being our intermediate produce and immediately after it is being consumed. So that's how you know it's an intermediate. It's only short-lived. Hello, Tamizi. We're on example 13 now. Okay. The next question, while you copy uh, this down on example 13, we will be looking at identifying the intermediates and the catalysts. I think we only have uh, yeah, one question to do this. So it's easy to get the intermediate and catalyst mixed up because catalyst also doesn't appear in the overall chemical equation, just like your intermediate, but there is a main difference between catalysts, okay? So one thing that you need to remember about catalysts is that it is, uh, it involves, uh, it is involved in a reaction, but at the end of the reaction, uh, it stays as it is, okay? Catalyst stays unchanged or the more exact, definition or the more exact term is that we say the catalyst is regenerated that means it is being reproduced okay so that's why we see it as oh the catalyst did not change actually it did get consumed and then we just regenerate reproduce the catalyst in its original form so that's um example 14 when a rate equation includes a species that is not part of the chemical reaction, then the species is a catalyst. Now, that I don't like that definition because intermediate also doesn't show up in the chemical equation. So what makes it different from uh, being a catalyst? Example 14 is looking at the reaction of a ketone 
which is what we call one, two, three, four, butanone. Okay, so this is the reaction of butanone with iodine to form the product, okay, and hydrogen iodide. So this reaction involves a catalyst. <clears throat> so the steps are given here, okay. So this one equation can only show you it goes from the reactant to the product, but the mechanism will actually show you how we transform the reactants to the products, okay? And it is broken down into four steps. And you can see that out of, out of these four steps, the first step is the fast, eh, sorry, uh, the second step is the slow rate determining step, okay? And the rate determining step, we just label, it's easy to spot it because it's always the slowest step. Okay, the question wants us to identify the difference between a catalyst and an intermediate. Well, it doesn't mention intermediate, but if you see the rate equation, you've got a K times by the butanone times by hydrogen plus ions, okay? Now, if you look at this step two, that's what we're interested in. The reactants, usually we only look at reactants, okay? The reactants is actually our intermediate. But we never write down the intermediate, okay, it's the same thing. Huh? We don't write down, we don't include intermediate in the rate equation. So I'll just remind you that intermediate is not written down, even though it is in the rate determining step, slow step, but we do not write it down in the rate equation. <coughs> Sorry. So this means we need to go back. We need to go back. What makes up this intermediate? Okay, and you can see that the intermediate is being formed here and then it is being consumed. So that's a hint of it being intermediate. Intermediate produce here. And then in step two, intermediate is being consumed. So I'm just going to explain the rate first. Um, that means if intermediate cannot appear in the rate equation, I have to go back and um, investigate what makes this intermediate, okay? And from step one, it shows that it is my butanone and my hydrogen plus ion that makes up the intermediate, okay? So that's why I have included the butanone, CH3, CH2, CO, CH3 plus H plus gives me my intermediate. Okay, so don't get confused. You may look at the rate equation and say, but miss the species appears in step one. Isn't step one the rate determining step or isn't step one the slow step? Actually, no, it is not. Okay, so it is. it can be confusing. Right, especially you don't know that um, it was actually the intermediate that appears. Okay, now, um, so that explains already why my rate equation shows the species in step one when it's actually step two is the rate determining step. Okay, I hope that makes um, sense. Okay, uh, so we've already. Um, identified our intermediate. Now I want to identify our catalyst, okay? So you notice that we have a H plus in the rate equation, but in our chemical equation, there's no H plus, yeah? So this suggests that our H plus is a catalyst. So we say H plus, is a catalyst 
because it appears on the rate equation, but not chemical equation. So make sure you understand the difference. Rate equation is where you have your K, K constant times concentration of whatever species. Your chemical equation is your balance equation with the stoichiometric number, okay? Um, hello, Rooney, we are looking at example 14. And another method to identify your catalyst is by looking at your catalyst being used up and then reproduced, regenerated, okay? So there's a difference between a catalyst and intermediate. An intermediate is we produce and then we use it up, whereas catalyst is the opposite, okay? Because we usually add catalyst to our reaction mixture, right? So that's why we use up the catalyst first, and then later on in any parts of the mechanism, whether it's step two, three, or four, but for this reaction, it appears in step two, we regenerate the catalyst, okay? So I'm going to identify this as our catalyst. Catalyst uh, consumed, and then our catalyst regenerated. So that's another way of seeing or confirming that it's a catalyst. Okay, so another way to remember is that catalyst does not appear in a chemical equation, rate equation. I will just try to make a table here so you can see. Okay, so catalyst does not appear in a chemical equation, but it appears in a rate equation. As for intermediate, it does not appear in both. It doesn't appear in your chemical equation. It also doesn't appear in your rate equation. That's why instead of writing down our intermediate, we go back one step and include the species that we ask to produce the intermediate, okay? So intermediate will not appear in both chemical equation or rate equation. Intermediates can only be seen in mechanism. That's because it is being produced for a short while and then it is being consumed immediately after. <clears throat> okay. Um, right, I think that is everything that I want to write down on this example. Okay, I'll let you copy Okay, I accidentally pressed uh, something on my earphone just now when it played, and I think that's recorded in our video. Let me just, okay. 
Right, so we are going to continue with the last part of this topic, and that is the section on catalysts. Okay, are everyone okay to move on? Okay, so the learning objective is to explain that catalysts can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. So what does homo means, uh, homo and hetero means? Um, it means as uh, the word that you understand it in your everyday um, context, okay? Hetero means different face, okay? Not different gender. Different face means like the state, right? The catalyst may be in a solid state and then your reactants and products in gas state. So that's what it means by heterogeneous. Homogeneous means the catalyst and reactants are in the same phase. So for example, your equation, your reactants are in gas state, and then your catalyst is also a gas. Um, it's just that they use uh, the term phase, which is a little bit different from state. Okay, Phase is when a boundary exists between two components. A good example would be water and oil. Water and oil are the same state, both of them are liquid, but they are different phase, okay? Because they have different layers. Um, so two immiscible liquids are in two different phase. So first we're going to look at the heterogeneous catalyst first. It often involves gases molecules reacting at the surface of a cell solid catalyst. The first example that we're going to look at is the iron metal in the Haber process. There are actually three modes of actions, okay? So the three um, points or the three main stages in a heterogeneous catalysis, okay? It includes adsorption. So be careful with the word. It's not absorption, it's ad, AD. That means uh, you stick onto the surface, okay? Adsorption means you stick on the surface. Uh, bond weakening and desorption. Desorption means the opposite of adsorption, which is you unstick, okay? That's not a, a technical word, but that's how you can understand it. So uh, we say that the first stage is adsorption. The second stage is where your reaction is happening. And the third stage is the desorption, okay? So looking at iron in the Haber process, First, we look at um, the diffusion step. Okay, but basically that's not like a, the major steps in a catalysis. It's just telling us that our reactants will move towards the catalyst. Okay, that's what diffu diffusion is. Um, it moves hydrogen and nitrogen to the surface of the metal. Adsorption, this is our main stage, okay? The first step. Adsorption is um, our reagents stick onto the surface of the ion catalyst in the Haber process. And uh, the force or the intermolecular force that is responsible to stick our reactants onto the metal must be strong enough to break the covalent bonds of the reactants, okay? But also it must be weak enough to break the attraction between the catalyst and whatever that is sticking onto it, okay? You do not want the adsorption, the force of attraction between the reactants and the catalyst to be strong because if it's really strong, they stick onto each other really, um, really well, then the desorption process would be difficult. Okay, so you just want to stick them just enough for them to stay during the reaction. And then after the reactants are being transformed into products, you can unstick them easily. Okay. What it means by strong enough to weaken the covalent bonds. Now, in order to form products, for example, plus 
uh, hydrogen to form NH3. To form NH3, you need to break the bonds of the nitrogen and you need to break the bonds of the hydrogen, correct? Okay, so you need a strong enough energy to break the bonds between the molecules. Okay, that's what it means by strong enough to weaken the covalent bonds within the nitrogen and the hydrogen molecule so the atoms can react together. Once you've broken down the bonds in the reactants, then only the atoms can form a new bond to produce the product. So that brings us to our next step, which is the reaction. So after you're done, with breaking down the covalent bonds in our reactant molecules, the atoms, okay, now these are atoms, the atoms will now form new bonds to, to, um, uh, to make the products. After products is formed, NH3, then the opposite of adsorption happens, which is desorption the bonds between the product and the catalyst is weakened and broken, and then it releases the product. So that's how a heterogeneous catalyst works. Okay, so diffusion, so now the product moves away. Okay, so step one and step five is actually just some extra information. Okay, the most important thing that you need to remember is step two, three and four. Step two is adsorption. Step three is the reaction. Step four is the desorption of product. Oops, sorry. Okay, so that's your born harbor process. We are now going to apply this same um, steps to the second example that we're going to look at, the catalytic removal of oxides of nitrogen in car exhaust, okay? So there is uh, like a system in fitted in cars, all right? But um, I will not go into details because I also don't know how it works. But what I know is that this um, system in the exhaust will convert all the harmful gases that is being give, uh, that is being produced um, from the engine of our car into something less harmful. Okay, so that's why we, we call it sometimes a catalytic converter. If you come across the term catalytic converter, this is converting any harmful gases from the working of a car uh, into something less harmful. Okay, so the overall equation is um, carbon monoxide reacting with nitrogen monoxide. And the catalyst will be one of these metals, um, platinum, palladium, or reun reunion, uh, RH. Okay, I don't remember RH. Into carbon dioxide. It is relatively not so harmful to us if we breathe it in, but of course, in the long run, it comes with uh, a different problem, like you, um, because it is a greenhouse gas, so it will pose a threat to the environment, okay? And then nitrogen. Nitrogen is quite neutral. So um, this is why we call it a catalytic converter, okay? So um, these metals, one of these metals are usually in a honeycomb structure okay the reason for this honeycomb structure is because it increases the surface area for these gases to be adsorbed onto the metal uh, catalyst okay <clears throat> so here i know the 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 diagram doesn't match with um our uh, equation that we're going to look at, but it is basically the same idea, okay? Instead of having a hydrogen gas, you will have your carbon monoxide gas and your nitrogen oxide gas adsorbing to the palladium metal, any of the metal catalyst. And then, of course, the second step is where reaction ha is happening. You break the bonds 
in the reactants and you produce or you form the bonds to make the product and then desorption uh, happens, okay? Well, desorption is not in this diagram. So first step is adsorption. Your nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide will be adsorbed onto the catalyst surface. So it sticks onto the catalyst surface. Um, I believe you will have to copy this down in your notes, okay? And then the second step is the reaction. So the reaction, uh, first you have to break the covalent bonds in the reactant molecule. You break the covalent bonds in nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide, and then you form new bonds. So the nitrogen atoms will form together to form N2 molecules and the carbon atom and oxygen atom will form together to form the carbon dioxide molecule, okay? So that's step two, reaction. Step three, will be the desorption, okay? That means the product is now going to be unsticked from the surface of the metal. So you can see that step one and step five just now from the previous example, which is diffusion, that's not so important, okay? So diffusion is just basically your reactants moving towards the catalyst and then your products moving away from the catalyst. Please let me know when you're done with this and then I will let you copy the next part, which is the desorption. Okay, done. Okay. And the last one is the desorption, which is the opposite of the adsorption. Okay, so while you're copying this down, I would just like to move on to the next one, which is catalyst poisoning. Okay, so remember just now earlier on, I mentioned that the force of attraction that sticks the reactants to the surface must be just the right amount, okay? We don't want it to be too strong, right? And we also don't want it to be too weak, of course. If it's too weak, then reaction cannot happen. The problem with the force of attraction of the reactants to the catalyst being too strong is that if it's too strong, that it cannot desorb, okay? That it cannot unstick, right? And this problem will lead to what we call a catalyst poisoning. That means because the reactants stick so much onto the catalyst, it doesn't want to go away. And now the surface of the catalyst cannot be used because there's something there, right? So this is what we mean by catalyst poisoning, right? Basically, in order to use a catalyst, you want the catalyst surface to be clear, okay? Another common poison is lead, okay, lead metal. If there is a lead metal or a lead coating or any other um, uh, chemical, actually, as long as your catalyst is being coated, the surface cannot adsorb to the gas molecules, okay? So whenever the surface of a catalyst is being covered or um, there's a layer that covers it, that means the catalyst has been poisoned. You cannot use it anymore, right? 
Okay, next we're going to move on to homogeneous catalyst. Homogeneous catalyst is when your catalyst and your reactants, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> are in the same phase. Um, so you have to describe the mode of action of a homogeneous catalyst by being um, one step and reformed in a later step. Okay, so that's the criteria of a catalyst. It is being used up and then it is being reformed or regenerated. First example is atmospheric oxides of nitrogen in the oxidation of atmospheric sulfur dioxide. Okay, um, usually homogeneous catalysis involves the change in oxidation number. Okay, so, and because catalyst involves in the change in oxidation number, a transition metal makes a good homogeneous catalyst, whether it's a metal, in which case your reaction um, species would also need to be in solid state, or uh, in ion, aqueous ions. Okay, so catalyst does not always have to be in a solid state or gas state, it also can be in aqueous ion. Uh, this is the equations that are involved in the acid rain formation. Okay, so um, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Sulfur dioxide is produced when fossil fuels contaminated with sulfur are burnt. Basically, the sulfur reacts with the oxygen and then you get the sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide will react with nitrogen dioxide, which acts as your catalyst. Okay. Sulfur dioxide on its own is not a problem, but when it is being uh, oxidized okay, um, into sulfur trioxide, then that's where the problem comes in because your sulfur trioxide is the one that will dissolve in water to give your acid ring. Okay, so let's just label this. Um, not much explanation will be needed for this Part, usually they just like you to memorize the equation. So please learn the equation. Okay, so that's oxidation of sulfur, then the nitrogen will be reduced. So you can see that the catalyst NO2 has been changed to NO, nitrogen monoxide. Okay, so nitrogen monoxide will react with the oxygen. <coughs> it will be oxidized back to the NO2, which is your catalyst in its original form. Okay, so the next part is just the regeneration or the reformation of your catalyst, uh, which is your NO2 catalyst. Okay, so um, just make sure you remember the equation, both of the equations uh, of the sulfur dioxide with the catalyst NO2, as well as the nitrogen monoxide being oxidized back to its original form of catalyst. And the problem in our acid rain is actually the sulfur trioxide, okay? Not sulfur dioxide. So students always get this confused. The question asks, um, explain how SO2 can result in acid rain. So they will write down SO2 dissolve in water, H2O, to form sulfuric acid. No, the first step is sulfur dioxide will first be oxidized to sulfur trioxide in the presence of a nitrogen dioxide catalyst, okay? And then <clears throat> only the sulfur trioxide will dissolve in water to form sulfuric acid, and this is what causes acid Ring. Okay, not SO2. <clears throat> um, I think in your notes, um, okay, I, I thought there was a typo in your notes. The regenerated NO2 molecule can, of course, again, attack another molecule of SO2. SO2 will be oxidized to SO3, and then SO3 will dissolve in water from the rain, and then it causes acid rain, okay? The dangerous thing about uh, nitrogen dioxide is that 
once it forms NO, nitrogen monoxide, it can just easily be oxidized back to the original form in the presence of oxygen. We have a lot of oxygen molecules in the environment. So that's why nitrogen dioxide um, can be found a lot in the environment and this will cause your acid rain. Okay, not much um, that you need to uh, learn for this reaction. There are no steps like adsorption, reaction, and desorption. Usually you just have to recall the equations, okay? Uh, the next example of a homogeneous catalyst is the reaction between iodine and persulfate uh, reaction, uh, reactant, okay? <clears throat> so it's called the iodine persulfate reaction. Persulfate is also called peroso, peroxodiosulfate or um, more commonly known as S2O82 minus. Now, this species is something that uh, I am pretty sure you have met this in practical. Okay, so this is what we um, per sulfate S2O82 minus. Okay, now per sulfate reacts with iodide in a redox reaction. So per, the S2O8 will be. Because it is an oxidizing agent, it will get reduced. The sulfur will get reduced. And the iodide will get oxidized. I minus is oxidized. Okay. Now, if we just look at this reaction, this reaction is very slow. Okay, without a catalyst, this reaction is very slow. Why? Because you look at persulfate, it is negatively charged. Iodide is also negatively charged. These two reactants will not like each other. Okay, they will repel off each other because of their um, negatively charged. Uh, they are both negatively charged species. So the catalyst that we are going to use is Fe2+. Plus and Fe3 plus, okay, a mixture of Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, and it is broken down into two parts, okay? Again, there's no steps. You just have to memorize the equation. Since it is a redox reaction, of course, there will be reduction as well as oxidation, okay? So what happens is that... Um, it's the reduction of Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus, okay? So don't get confused, huh? Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus is reduced where your iodide is being oxidized, okay? Balance equation, if you don't want to memorize this, you can always refer to the data booklet, but my concern is that the data booklet may not be, uh, sorry, the half equation may not be provided to you in the full version. So that's the only risk, okay? Um, oxidation, Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, and then, so that is oxidized. Your per sulfate is being reduced to uh, sulfate ion. So you can see your products, iodine and sulfate ions, okay? Fe2+, plus, Fe2+, plus, well, they are just floating around in the reaction mixture, okay? But the most important thing is that you form your product, iodine, as well as your sulfate ion. The order of the reaction does not matter. I, either oxidation or reduction could happen first, okay? You don't need any further explanation for this one. Um, the only type of uh, question that they can ask you is to write down the equation. So please learn the equation. Learn equations. 
Okay, and lastly, I will just show you how to draw the energy profile diagram for this persulfate reaction with iodide ion. So usually an energy diagram is, um, I'll show you, is the red one in the diagram. Okay, are you done with this? Can we move on? <clears throat> You're done copying, huh? Okay, right. So the normal energy diagram is you start here and then you end here, okay? But for this catalyzed reaction of a persulfate ion and the iodide um, ion, with the presence of Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus, there is what we call a double hump. Okay, so the first activation energy is for the reduction of Fe3 plus, and then the second activation energy is for the uh, oxidation of Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. Okay. And then you've got the le le level of uh, reactants and the level of products. Now, even though there are two activation energy in this catalyzed reaction, it is still lower than the uncatalyzed reaction. Okay, Remember that the function or the role of a catalyst is to provide an alternative path with a lower activation energy, okay? So activation energy of the uncatalyzed reaction is this. I'll just label somewhere here, okay? That's the EA of uncat. And then these two are the EA of catalyzed reaction. Okay, so they're still much lower than the uncatalyzed reaction. Okay, so that statement is already there. Although there are two steps, the overall activation energy is um, still lower than in single um, a single uncatalyzed reaction, okay? So another thing that I want to point out here is that you see this, even though there's two humps, okay? This is considered an exothermic reaction, okay? Exothermic reaction is where you have your reactants having higher energy than um, the products, okay? So that is all. That's the end of our topic. Um, I'm so glad we managed to finish that in one lesson because I actually didn't want to drag this over. Let me just stop the recording.